I'd never made a documentary film. I was learning how to use a camera and I didn't know how to, all those little dials and buttons and what they all did. To be over there and to be doing that with those people, at some point I felt like I was this serious person doing this very serious thing, but then sometimes I really had to back up and just kind of grasp the reality. No, I'm just some knucklehead from LA, you know? Never been in a conflict zone, never near one. I, you know, watch the news and I see this footage. All of a sudden I'm landing in this place, barricades and machine guns and artillery and mortar and I was kind of in a state of shock. You know, that is our story, you know? It's, it's this journey that we go on and all the crap that we have to put up with. Very few people are gonna have the patience to, to wait any of this out and they're gonna give up and they're gonna go home or they're gonna get scared and they're gonna go home, or they're going to get you know, too frustrated and they just can't take it. We've gotta get in, get on all the way in there past the last of the Congolese troops because the Congolese government does not want us talking to them, period. And so the, you know, if they found out that we were doing that, they'd arrest us. When we get to him, then we gotta get all the way out of here and then all the way out of the Congo with these tapes. We're after the truth, period. We figure that nobody has the right to keep us from the truth. The main point for me to accomplish was to open up communication where I knew it wasn't happening. I wanted to do that, challenge myself with this medium of film, challenge myself with journeying deeper into Africa. So those are personal points, but on the global bigger picture, I wanted to open up communication for these people that were cut off from the outside world. If you can't express yourself and people can hide you, they can do whatever they want to you. Whether you're right or wrong, freedom of speech is very important to me. This is how I met Tony and his family, in Africa, doing a humanitarian mission. I was hired by one of the sponsors to film the project. We met some contacts and heard a few compelling stories about gold and rebels in Africa. By the end of the trip, Tony asked if I would return to Africa with him to make a documentary. Now, the initial inspiration for this trip came from the exceptional photographs of Marcus Bleasdale. We saw his photos and were instantly wanting to capture that on video. He is also the one who connected us to our main contact in the Congo. While we were doing research for our trip, one name kept showing up. It was a rebel general. His name was Laurent Kunda. He has control of the Northeast Congo which has vast deposits of gold. Our questions and reasons were simple. What is going on in a place where war has raged for years, 5.4 million people have died, and almost no news ever comes out of the region? What are they fighting for? Gold, oil, power? That's what everybody else is fighting for, and if that's the case, then so be it. But the only way we were gonna come up with something even remotely original was to talk to General Kunda himself. So now we had found our subject and rebels, but how far were we willing to go to get the story? Talking to American Express to get tickets to Africa. So we're in, we're going, it's not happening? 
Looks like it. After uh, a little ping pong over the last three days, we're going, no, we're not, we're going, we're not, we're going, and now we're going. My wife has agreed to allow me to go for two weeks to investigate the mining abuses, but I have to stay away from the rebels and the wars. I'm scared he's going to part of Africa that's dangerous and there's fighting over there and I don't really know what to expect. Tony and I have agreed that he's to do his best to just go there for two weeks and come home. So I just want to let you know that's coming up quick. About 11 days? Somewhere around 10 days. It, we have to get online and start checking on airplane tickets and all that. That's kind of going to dictate too because if I think it's 10 days with the airplane tickets for 9 days, some things are scary and I will just be afraid and have to keep going. You know? Me? I just try to stay inspired. At 30, I finally settled down and got married to my camera. This makes me luckier than Tony on this journey because I get to take my wife with me and he has to leave his behind. Now we're not celebrities, we're not affiliated with any news agency, and we don't have unlimited funds. Can we even get access to the story we're after? Now we had to fly into Entebbe, Uganda. It's one of the most accessible routes into the Northeast Congo. It's very tough to get around Africa once you're on the continent. Missionary Aviation Fellowship is one of the few airlines that's willing to fly into a conflict zone. Just one quick question before yes. we take off. Uh -huh. Have you ever done this before? Uh, no, I'm gonna get the pilot's manual out right now and Fantastic. check it out. As we fly to Bonia, I'll give you the dime store tour of Congo's history. The primary reason the Congo is in chaos today is because until just recently, they have never experienced self-rule. Joseph Kabila has been president since 2001, but even he was not democratically elected until 2006. So for the last 125 years, their laws, customs, and religion have been forced upon them by the ruling countries. Congolese democracy is what a toddler looks like while learning to take its first few steps. In this same time period, the country has been renamed five times. There has been continuous war, and almost every country in the world has been raiding their natural resources. They have a paralyzing identity crisis. In 2004, General Laurent Kunda was promoted from colonel to general in the Congolese National Army. He was sent by President Joseph Kabila to the Northeast Congo to protect his Tutsi tribemen from Hutu militia in the area. Eventually, the order was rescinded, and he was told to come back to Kinshasa. Kunda knew his Tutsi tribemen were still in imminent danger, so he rebelled and stayed in the region with his loyal troops of the 81st and 83rd Brigade. So why are we after his story? Through our contacts, we received information that armed Hutu militias from the Rwandan genocide are in the area killing Tutsis, and neither the Congolese government or the UN are protecting them. He was taking control of North Kivu to protect the Tutsi population that the government and the Congolese army had no way of doing. Kinshasa is thousands of miles away, and they don't have the money or resources to do anything. Before we touched down, there were already three strikes against us. One, we were white. Two, we didn't speak the language. Three, we had cameras with us. We had to land in Bunya to meet our fixer. From there, we'd make our way south to Goma, which is a town near Kunda's territory. Pastor Marion Padongo was born in Uganda, but moved to the Congo as a young man, so he's Congolese by nationality. He became a fixer and interpreter to international journalists during the Great Baturi Ethnic War in 2003. You got it, yes? Yeah, these are the visas. We paid for a one-month visa. They gave us eight days and told us to return before that expired. This was our introduction to Congo bureaucracy. And on our way out of the airport, we got our first taste of Congo authority, a simple barrier that required permission to cross, even though we just passed through customs. And then, three minutes down the road. Boss, you're attack an <laughs> Pastor knew the people and slid us right through. Pastor Marion is 
one of the people that knows the Congo, Uganda, Eastern Africa as well, if not better than anybody you will ever meet. And everybody knows who he is. He is a real pastor. He does a lot of good for the people, but he's also one of the best hustlers I've ever seen. Now, Bunya is just like the Wild West. Shops and saloons lining the dirt roads, but instead of horses, everyone has a motorcycle and a gun. Tony and I were the quintessential outsiders wandering into town, not knowing what trouble lay ahead. Because of the ongoing conflict in the Northeast Congo, the UN is everywhere. They go by the French acronym MANUC, which translates to Mission of United Nations Democratic Republic of Congo. Now we have our initial Congo visas, but these have to be extended. Of course, our journalist credentials are only good for Bunya. So of course, this is going to add to more paperwork, sitting in offices and spending more cash we don't have. The UN has not delivered our press credentials, but they are going to fly us to Goma. And that will save us a big chunk of change, but there is a 48-hour wait for all UN flights. The, the UN for me is a complete love-hate relationship. They were 50% extremely helpful. 50% of it was the most obnoxious bureaucracy that I had ever seen. Since we had time before our flight, Pastor suggested we visit an orphanage. He sent us to one of the many in the area. This is the big tragedy of the Congolese War. There are children everywhere without parents. They are the innocent victims of this conflict. The next morning, Pastor drove us 25 miles outside of Bunya to a mining town. We were going to try to connect the war to the gold. It was a community working together to mine this gold. The people seemed fed. They seemed content. The homes were well built. The kids were working hard, but yet they were also having fun. Nice. Where were the guys holding the guns, forcing these people to do this work? We did not find any of these abuses that we had researched about. The miners here were keeping a very fair percentage of the gold they were extracting from the earth, and they had never given any of it to our rebel group. We're definitely not saying it doesn't exist, because we know it does. But we didn't find it here. After leaving the mining town, we cruised down to the local gold exchange, where buyers and sellers meet. <laughs> His name actually was Mr. Cash. He took a lot of time to explain just how the gold business worked, all the way up to the end buyer in the DRC. But he didn't really seem to know what happened to the gold beyond that point. From there, we pressed him trying to get info about human rights abuses and people who were forced to dig gold at gunpoint. Although he had heard of this in the past, but he wasn't aware where this was happening anymore. The next day, we decided to go into another mining town to see if we could find any evidence of gold being channeled to the rebels. On the way, we reached a roadblock and they would not let us pass. I was livid. I called the UN playing the big producer from LA. This was when we fully realized how useless our cell phone was against an AK-47. And of course, they wouldn't let us through. After this hassle, Pastor Marion took us to an internally displaced people or IDP camp to show us where his countrymen settled because it's just too dangerous for them to return to their villages. And of course, Pastor Marion knew the head of the camp and they opened the door for us to come right on in. We are in Chomia, close to Lake Albert, and this is a refugee camp. Some of them came here because their villages are not secured up to now. The National Army cannot provide security there, even Monok. The Hem are here because they were afraid of Lendo killing them.
we passed out soccer balls and had some fun with the kids. Even in the most dire situations around the world, it only takes a soccer ball to transform children into their natural state of pure joy. They're inviting us to look at their life, as dismal as it is, and uh, it's very touching. Very touching. I cannot believe the contrast from my life to what I'm looking all around me. I don't even know how to wrap my mind around that. It's just outside of something I can comprehend. IDP camp that we went to in Lake Albert, um, where it was near the water, um, that day it was 120 degrees. There was no wind, there was no nothing. It was 120 degrees. It was so hot that it was hard to stand after a while. The government's not helping them. It is, it's one of the hardest things that psychologically you can take as a person. But as we move from tent to tent, the heat and the reality of this way of life became overwhelming. Doug, what's going on here? Well, the, the child fell asleep in the sun and burned her skin really, really bad. And she's really dehydrated as well. So, can I get any water in here? Yeah, we're gonna get, we're definitely gonna do that. is really a tragedy. Uh, getting to see the inside of some of these places is, and it just rips at your heart. And then watching this child who's obviously <laughs> suffering, the parents really don't quite understand what to do, even basic first aid for their child. You want to fix it, you want to solve the problem, you realize you don't have the resources to do that, but the misery and suffering is everywhere around you. And it, it makes you angry. And then, 20 minutes later, Africa showed us how quickly the table can turn. Now we were the ones who needed rescuing. No, we had the air conditioning on, a lot of weight. It's really hot out here and the car overheated, so some guy was nice enough to come by on his motorbike and go back to the nearest town, which is 15, 20 minutes away, one way. So we'll probably be here for about an hour, waiting for him to come by. Merci beaucoup for the agua. Wait, wait, do you have the cover? Doug has it. And we just put all of our drinking water in the radiator. And not far from the IDP camp, Pastor took us to a guy who had survived a massacre in his own village. We've been on the road and we're dusty and dizzy from, we can't find uh, water. So we're, uh, we've been a couple hours now of really, really being thirsty. And it's a really good uh, illustration of just how wimpy we are as Americans. These people go days without water and just a little bit of water. So it's, it's, it's a good lesson how to understand how, uh, how different our worlds are. Here, the dead have not been buried. They've been left in place as evidence of a war crime that is still under investigation. Jamala yango kabisa kabisa ni jamala yango watu yango nakufa kumi na moja apa boko. Tuseme bato mi a saba makumi tano. This just sense of death was very close and present. See that mortal wound on his head. And we couldn't shake it. And inside of me, I began to want to know more about the war and how it affected people instead of who was paying for it. Just think of the violence that must have taken place right around here. Went through these people's minds, and it's absolutely fear. 
resources are gold, silver, whatever they have, they're a part of the problem. It just was another element that drew us deeper into this conflict is about people. So much of the turmoil in the Northeast is blamed on General Kunda. I'm intrigued by the fact that really, there isn't much known about him. And what I want to know, does he have any connection with all of this tragedy we have just seen? You want to go down and see Nakunda, right? That's your big, that's a, that, that's a big deal to you. Yeah, dude, when I started studying this, I mean, he was the guy I keyed in on, and I thought, wow, if I could talk to that guy. The electricity just went out. The electricity's gone. <laughs> yeah, it's normal. There's nothing here. It's a struggle. I mean, I got Audie. I understand her position because she's not here. Yeah, I wish I could stay longer. I'm stuck. I, I have to honor her. This is her first time letting me go. It's very difficult to do that. Darkness. Ah. <laughs> we just don't seem to have any time, which is a real drag, because I'd rather, you know, have you with me. Well, I don't even know at this point if I'm going to personally get to Goma. You're probably going to go there by yourself. And I mean, that's, that's what it's looking like at this point. Yeah. The frustration was quite high through these different government organizations and lies and half-truths and foreign languages. And it, it's very hot here right now, which just only adds to it. We just decided to break our fatigue and sort of reset. So, we rented a couple of motorcycles and hit the town. Yeah, you were cruising right ahead of me, man. And right after that, I think they saw you go through and they were curious. I tried to drive around them. So they stopped me in the middle of the road. I didn't want to get out my license because it's right next to my money. And I knew if I whipped out all my cash, it would just escalate. Yeah. But they said the reason they pulled me over is because I had this bandana on my head. They would have preferred I look like that. There were like eight or ten people thick all around me watching me. Which, of course, meant the policeman had to like present himself. I was sitting there, I knew no matter what I said, no matter what I did, it wasn't going to make a difference. They were going to have their way. It was going to cost me some money. The biggest thing was we were leaving the next day for Goma on a UN flight. If I have to spend the night in jail, if I have to be processed through whatever their justice system is, it was a big worry on my mind. And I was frantic inside to get a hold of the pastor because I knew with his skill set, he'd find a way to resolve it. Been officially arrested in the Congo nice. for no helmet and looking like a bad guy. The UN was gracious enough to give us a flight for free. My ticket back home allowed me one more day in Africa. I joined Doug on a UN flight to Goma. I was really disappointed with the fact that I would not meet General Kunda. Now on the flight to Goma, my apprehension started setting in. We were en route to a rebel general who was accused of crimes against humanity and the recruitment of child soldiers. And we have no idea if that's just the press or the truth about him. And on top of all that, there's an international arrest warrant out for him. We are in Goma. We are going to the hotel. Hotel La Frontier. La Frontier. We had just arrived from Bunya where people were pretty edgy about being filmed. But in Goma, it could be downright dangerous. Well, Goma is just, it's, it's a thieves and outlaws, man. It's an outlander place. And it is on the very edge of the actual conflict occurring. Paranoia is higher and mistrust. After many attempts, I was finally able to convince my wife that it was not wise to allow Doug to go into rebel territory alone. Tony going to see Laurent Kunda, General Laurent Kunda and the rebel came down to one phone call to his wife. Or he had to fly out of there the next day. When Tony called and said that the mining town really wasn't what, that's what they thought they were, their journey was about, and um, it wasn't quite that. They had gotten there and realized that um, more of it had to do with the refugee camps they had been seeing and, and the massacres, and that led to why is this going on, so, it led, so which led to the rebels, and it led to Kunda. And I'm here in my little bubble here in America having really no idea what that means. Part of me thought this is absolutely crazy. Um, why is he doing this? But another part of me was, wow, if this is really for real, he needs to do it. And if he can make a difference by communicating with them and by getting in there and seeing really what this is all about, then, you know, the side of me that thought that was good. I can't quite say I was comfortable with it, but I knew it was what needed to get done.
So now we had to contact the UN and Goma and the bureaucracy starts all over again. And of course our press passes will take a few days. We needed to see the Congolese to get a visa extension and press credentials for Goma. We knew all this paperwork was a way to generate income for the country, so we played along. The problem was all the time wasted that we could be working. Ta-da! These are our accreditations to film here. And uh, this in and of itself is a wonderful accomplishment. It's about 9.30 in the morning. We were supposed to meet uh, Pastor Marianne at about 7.30. But uh, it seems as there's been some complications. The story right now is our driver was already arrested this morning. Yeah, there are, there's just checkpoints everywhere. And I guess there was a murder last night uh, close to our hotel. So the security's really tight. They're looking for somebody in a car just like ours. So they keep checking our car because they're looking for a murderer, assassins that have a Pajero, which we are driving in. So we have press credentials and press up on the car, but it's still, you know, they pull you over and they can, you know, just about do anything. I got this. And now this is dry. Let's go see the general. Another checkpoint. This is number five today. There is an issue at each roadblock that you have to cope with the people that are there their expectations, their experience, and their wants. They told us that we needed UN permission to get through. Luckily, there was a UN outpost just 50 yards away. Uh, basically, I am over here uh, looking after four IDP camps. Okay. There are good about 50,000 uh, IDPs here. The Congolese who stopped us at the checkpoint walked up to join us. After a social time, the UN invited us back for dinner and told the Congolese to allow us through the roadblock. And of course, we did not tell any of them we were trying to get to General Kunda. The thing about the Congolese army, you don't know if they're going to be friendly or going to arrest you or hassle you. They are an unpaid army with weapons. In America, we would call them a gang. This is a town called Saki, which is kind of the Bronx of the Northeast Congo. Even the BBC could not pass this checkpoint while they were doing their report on the conflict here. The people would not let them pass. They almost set fire to the pastor's car on the last time they were in this town. So it's a tinderbox, you know, and we got to be really careful. Where is it at? Right there? Stop. Yeah. No, Stop. You can't Stop here. Here. Oh. 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 Stop. Okay. Is that the checkpoint? We can just go. Just go. Go up there. Go up there. It's my nuke. Looks like my nuke. Can we go up to the checkpoint? Yeah, see if anybody's coming from behind us. The military guy there said we couldn't go through without a stamp. So now we have to drive all the way back into Goma to get a stamp. Which will make it about our 20th. But on the bright side, we're finding out that there is no system and nothing makes any sense at all. Which does give us a little bit more freedom. But it also tells us that the inmates are running the asylum. But what you get done that day also depends on the mood of the inmate because that's what we're after. We're gonna find out what this guy's about and what he stands for and what he believes in. Because the rules and laws change depending on which faction or government or entity you're talking to, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. We just had a meeting with the colonel here of the Congolese army and uh, he gave us another stamp and another signature to get in certain areas, but we still can't get in Kunda's area. And we are now going to Manuk to try to get clearance to go into that area. With their house. 
with Manuk's help. But we're a bit worried about that because we don't want their help because they may uh, tell us no and they might make it more difficult. So it's uh, under great consideration and debate between us here. Here at the UN, uh, we did order a sandwich. And what we're going to need to do to get that sandwich, first they're going to get the bread, but then we got to fill out some forms to get the meat and the cheese. But the cheese comes from a different office. So once we fill out that form, the cheese form is like two pages long. Do they have the cheese form here? I don't know. They may have to fax the cheese form from Kinshasa. And once we get that, we will fill it out, and we will probably go for American cheese, maybe some Swiss, I don't know. But then uh, when they do finally get the cheese here, we will be able to build the sandwich. Once we get all this and then we get approval to consume the sandwich, we will be eating. And we definitely plan on getting this done in the next six hours because we're starving. As you can see, I just filmed what the UN produced as a cheese sandwich, which was really sort of a weird omelet thing with two French rolls. We filled out more paperwork. We got more signatures. And tomorrow we're supposed to get another credential from the UN. Don't really know what it means or what it's for, but hey, just add it to the pile of papers we carry around and show everybody. We're carrying around thousands of dollars in cash, and we have got to find a place to hide this before we go into rebel territory. And so at dinner tonight, I'm going to ask our Indian friends to uh, hold on to it for us. We'll just hope for the best. You know, they, I think, were just as entertained as we were. They were kind of bored out there, and we probably <laughs> brought them a little something just by showing up and talking about the West. It was like their delight to see how good of a servant they can be. That was the best Indian food I've ever had. And then we have some homemade fruit custard or something that some chef couldn't prepare in a modern kitchen for dessert. <laughs> underneath a volcano at night, which was completely surreal. They agreed to hold our money, which was great, but we either made the right decision or we just had the most expensive meal in history. We just finally got our uh, Manuk accreditation after eight days. Something finally got done, which is uh, really fantastic. So now we're kind of official uh, UN people here, so we can stop getting hassled as much. Now that we are official, our credentials allow us access to a UN press conference. And this is when the UN began telling the horror stories of the Kunda-controlled area, and you simply had to take their word for it, because they were not going to escort journalists into this area or help you get the story. We have to be careful about the security situation in that area when we take the media, because only when engagements have stopped that we can consider taking the media into these areas. Yes, so from the know. outsider's perspective, uh, from the United States, does Manuk understand what uh, General Kunda is fighting for? And do you understand the conditions? Can you name these conditions? And do you guys get involved in the negotiation process between the both armies? Once again, uh, a political question. Yes, we are aware of uh, what the demands of uh, the CNDP led by Kunda are. However, we are working within the framework of the overall process in which Monuk has been invited by the government of DRC and that negotiations between the rebel groups are to be decided by the government of DRC and the higher hierarchy of Monuk. It is not a military mandate. Well, thank you and in the end, I would like to, to you, to the media, Kindly communicate to the people that the Monuk is here very much to ensure peace and stability and for the protection of the people of the RC. Thank you. After hearing the UN's political spin, we'd had enough. We hit the road. We were going to find out about Kunda ourselves. We have a road full of these checkpoints ahead of us. And we could be arrested at any one of them if we were caught rolling our cameras. Even going through a UN checkpoint with UN credentials is a big hassle. At every turn, it appeared that someone was hiding something from the media. Bini, A, A, R, B, I, N, 
When I felt that anxiety, that pressure, that adrenaline rush the most was at the final checkpoint. We'd already been turned around at that place before. So look, reinforcements are coming. Hopefully they're really drunk and stoned. You and I were sitting in the car trying to film a little bit of it and pastors out there arguing with those people and it took a long time to get through that one. So pastor is working out all the details here. Uh... Pastor Marion's amazing. He's always fighting the good fight. He believes in freedom of the press, and he believes in you know that his country, the Congo, can be one day you know a free country and uh, hopefully a peaceful place. It's always like that. There's always a gun and somebody telling you what not to do. After all those credentials and all those stamps, Pastor talked us through that final checkpoint without even having to show our passports or giving them a dime. And it's absolutely gorgeous here. And we're on our way to Kunda. This is a Kunda controlled area. We're inside. That was that was my partner Tony who's probably gonna get us killed eventually. Oh Pastor, where are we going right now? And now we are going to Mshaki, a village controlled by Lauren Kunda, General Laura Kunda, and uh, like uh, 20 kilometers from where we are now, around 40 kilometers from Goma town. Now we're actually in the territory of rebels. What does this mean? And Pastor was warning us as we were making our way up to the first village, which was quite a drive. They're everywhere in this forest. They're watching us. They have rockets teamed on us, guns teamed on us. Just keep your cameras down, be cool, and we'll make our way up there slowly. The second we crossed that line, the second we decided to, to go past the last checkpoint, we became rebels. So we were in trouble. We were in the middle of nowhere. If we disappeared, they may discover what happened five years down the road, but it's not like there's forensic science. There's no investigation. You're just free falling. The stamps and the journalist stuff, that was just to get through the Congolese army. The second you cross the other side of the fence, they don't care what kind of credentials you have, obviously, because they're in a lawless land. We put all that stuff away the second we drove over that line because we wanted to be as unofficial filmmakers as possible. We quickly realized we were not prepared. There are no handbooks on how to conduct yourself in an African village controlled by armed rebels. What were we headed for? and whom were we headed towards. When we had our first official meeting with Kunda security commanders, the first thing they said to us, we need you to know that you're breaking the law. We need you to know that the consequences are you will be arrested. You do not have a way to escape from where we are. There's two roads going out of here and they're heavily guarded and you're two white people with cameras and they know you're in our territory now, identifying you with us. Do you really want to do that? Uh, we just had a meeting with uh, the chief of security for Kunda yes, and says uh, that we're welcome to be here and we can film and do what we want here. surrounded by kids right now, but we seem to have found some kind of Xanadu. All the children are happy, everybody's well fed. Maybe we've stumbled across something that the world doesn't know, that the Congolese government isn't taking care of their people, so Lauren Kunda may be. They had plenty of cows, a pharmacy, and churches taking place outside on this beautiful hill. We have to finish this film here and get the hell out of here because otherwise, once we go back, the, the, arm, the Congolese army will know that we were here and we will be arrested. We clearly understood our situation, so they provided us with a security escort and we moved ahead. Once that commander got in the car with his AK-47, we, were <laughs> we weren't going to go, hey, you know, we'd love to turn around now and just kind of go back to the hotel. There was no turning back. I'm looking at the vastness of this area and wondering, did we just volunteer to become hostages? 
the wildest ride I've ever taken. It's amazing. It's so gorgeous. And the road is unbelievable. This is four-wheel driving times ten. In 1994, during the Rwandan genocide, almost one million Tutsis were killed with machetes by Hutu rebels. Following that massacre, many of those Hutu rebels fled to this very area that we are driving through. They continue to bring chaos and upheaval to the region. Kunda himself is a Tutsi, claiming to be protecting his own tribesmen. But there are many reports and allegations that say he's just another power-hungry warlord Well, we got stuck. This farmer showed up with his hoe slash shovel and we dug ourselves out. We said, hey man, we should take that with us. Tony gave him 20 bucks. The commander who was with us walked over to the guy and took the money back and said, no, 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 you don't do that with us. We'll get the shovel back to him. There's our man right there. He's got his fancy shoes on, his collar, and he's loving life. Pastor was always freaking out. We always had to calm him down and this is the roughest road I've ever been on. Pastor Marion, what do you think of the road we're on? Oh, I'm telling you, this road is terrible. We are going to Kilolire, which is around 70 kilometers or five, 50 kilometers ahead, but very bad road. When he gets in hot water, he's kind of like a character, just straight out of a movie. He's always panicking, and he doesn't know what to do. And we're like, relax, dude. But of course, we don't live there, you know? So we always had to kind of be empathetic to his plight. But he would always be like, yes, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. And then once we were in, you know, over our heads, you know, he would always have all these doomsday scenarios <laughs> that he would give us. What they are going to do is first string us up. I'm really excited because uh, the end of the road is seemingly very close now. And, uh, the road, I don't know to see what else is going to stop us from reaching our goal. Now, during the day, our filming was much more relaxed and accepted. But at nightfall, the soldiers returned from their scouts and missions, and our situation got a lot more intense. It became much more military than welcome to our village. Tony, is anybody getting agitated? No, they're curious, they're scared. It's cool. No, but it, look for agitation. We're outside, we got out of there, but they got they got angry that we were taking photographs out there. And uh, it's just, uh, this is just a really wild place. Hmm? said turn off the camera. said turn it off. They're just telling us what to do next moment to next moment. Get out of the car. Stay in the shadows. Follow me. Don't talk. They took us inside the place where we were staying, and things got a little bit weird. And they sat us down on this wooden frame of a couch. There was no padding there. It was just this wooden, really uncomfortable wooden frame. It's starting to rain outside. It's cold. It's dark. Nobody's really explained what's going to happen to us. 
they took our bags and they took them back in this room and we were sitting there and I went, oh man, those are cameras, that's everything we had. There's a passports in there and everything. And I was sitting there thinking, are we hostages or guests? And then it just kind of welled up in me really quickly and I stood up and I said, you know what? I'm gonna go grab my camera right now because I'm gonna film this. That was the test. You know, if they said, no, you can't do that, you knew the exact situation you were in. Then you literally have to start thinking of escape and, you know, where's that gun and where's that gun? And that literally was what was going through my mind, you know, how to get out of this. They let me go back and then they said, don't film our faces, but they let me have my camera back. I was starting to go numb there and when Doug got the camera, he came back and he kind of gave me a, everything's cool, man. I saw our stuff, nobody's messing with it. It, it brought calm. And they all sat around and we had dinner and kind of paranoia kicked in, friendship, but also enemy written in their eyes, like, you know, and suspicion. And it was really dimly lit and you kept looking at these guys in the eyes wondering, wow. Tonight we are having a dinner of banana and beans. Um, we've been asked to spend the night alongside the road. Uh, perhaps we'll have a meeting tomorrow, we're not sure. And uh, we'll see what adventure awaits us tomorrow. They asked us questions about what we were going to talk to Kunda about and seeing if we were sincere, seeing if we were going to go spread a bunch of uh, propaganda for the other side. Just the idea of both of us trying to share a bed was something obviously we were going to have to get out of it. We had no other choice. Pastor Marion shows up. He's like, hello, I'm going to sleep with you. We were trying to whisper and talk about the intensity of our situation and nobody is really clear with us if we could meet Kunda. So that began to really frustrate Doug, and he wanted to go confront Kunda's soldiers and get to the bottom of this. They sometimes are like siblings where they brawl. There's times where they understand each other without speaking. There's times that their synergy works really well to get them through situations, and I know that. But they definitely have a blow-to-blow -blow sometimes type of relationship, but it does seem at the end of the day they push through it and um, they're able to accomplish what they do. I, I always consider us brothers in the sense of brothers always have a love-hate relationship. I felt it was necessary to just simply draw his anger out. And whatever I had to do to get that out in this environment, I was going to do. So if it meant actually picking a fight with him to relieve some of that tension, that's what it took. And I tried to do that as gently as possible, but it was necessary. Me and Tony do fight. When we go, when we travel together, we, it's a contentious relationship but it's also a very creative relationship and a very conducive relationship. So we decided to go outside and talk about it a little bit louder. We went out there and we just had this little fight in the lightning to just vent. I've had the best days of my life in Africa and the angriest, most out of control feelings that I've ever had in my life in Africa. So I've had the extreme of both. As we talked, I was getting more and more angry at the fact that we had no idea if we were even going to see the general. Tony, very wisely, started to channel my potentially reckless anger towards him and away from our hosts. But is it really serving you to be this pissed off? It's hurting right now. It, to well, vent fucking anger and you, and you, I mean, the only thing we have up here is each other and you want to fucking pick a fight with me. That's genius. The entire fucking place is circling around us with guns and ammunition, and you want me mad at you. That's brilliant. So I get mad, and then I fucking get it out, and it goes away. All right, Just get it like out. you can. See, it's you coming out. Get angry? I'm drawing it you out of you. Get angry? It's working, isn't it? You want to get angry? Go ahead and get fucking angry. I'm drawing it out of you, aren't I? Well, no, no. Yeah, you're just here being, it comes. You're, now you're just being Let it like flow, a bro. Kid. Let it flow. We're having a little jungle therapy out here in Lightning. Stayed the night here last night um, in uh, one of the guys, uh, one of the rebel shacks here, and we had to sleep three of us in a bed, and uh, it was, we, we all slept well. I think Tony was probably rolling around just a little bit too much. Um, it was a bit of adventure sleeping between Pastor Mario and Doug. I had the worst spot on the bed. These two would roll over right into me, but uh, we made it through the night, so. Did we snort all? They both snored in stereo on either side of me. I think I got, honestly, about two hours of sleep last night. As we were filming this, two soldiers approached and told us to go back inside until we received orders to move to the next village. That's why you can't go outside unless we go to the shaman 
because all the trucks parked outside here are the people going to Goma and info, information can be spread it up out that there are some white men in the shaman's area. So we have to stay in this little hut for our protection and our, to keep secrecy more than anything else, right? Exactly. We're kind of ushered out of there quickly, tired, hungry. We were at a church and there was a big celebration, people everywhere, inside outside, kids everywhere. I didn't expect the rebels to be as organized and civilized and the way that they were. I didn't expect that at all. I thought they'd be just these rogue people that uh, were very dangerous to be around. And no, in fact, they were very orderly and disciplined. Somehow I pictured somebody really dirty in military garb with a bunch of guns and a bunch of hostages with him in really horrible conditions, terrible area with, you know, chain link fences and barbed wire holding the people in. And, you know, what is he doing to the people? What does he look like? What does he say? You have this rebel warlord preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to hundreds of people. And inside this church, where there was hundreds of people, there was about 10 guys with machine guns, guns, grenade launchers, while he's preaching the gospel. And then he leads them in song. You know, I thought we were gonna go talk to some, you know, we were gonna meet him in some headquarters and he was gonna be stomping around, giving orders to everybody to kill everything in sight. The first thing we saw was him preaching the gospel and people leading people in a way in, into a positive, you know, uh, in a positive direction in their lives. Surreal. Surreal beyond words. After the church service is over, we're told to follow their convoy. This is just a hospital. It was Palm Sunday, so the general had a ceremony where he passed out palm leaves to his commanders in appreciation for their loyalty. We noticed that within their group, there seemed to be a very tight bond. What is this place? It's a Catholic church uh, residence. Okay. Uh, they are priests. Oh, okay. Catholic priests. It's insanely hot in there. I'm sweating. I'm tired. We were setting up and it was very slow. They weren't, nobody's really doing anything. I had to get out of that building and get some fresh air. And I go outside and just kind of get a bunch of B footage of the place. I tried to get some footage, but I was too tired, so I simply went to the car and laid down. Tony didn't tell anyone where he was going, including me. Lunch was ready, and everyone was patiently seated, so the general sent someone to go get him. This is this monumental moment. I'm supposed to be filming this, and I have no energy. None. I was spent completely done. Suddenly someone starts tapping on the door and they open it up and there's a soldier standing there with a gun telling me to get out of the car. So I cautiously walk inside and then they take me in the dining room and I see everyone sitting and Kunda was being really cool. He's like, oh, would you please join us for dinner and have a seat? Very clear that everyone had been waiting for me. So I tried to make nice with him and make conversation and just kind of lighten the mood, but he was, Kunde was very nice, total gentleman about it. Me, I'm a pastor. We became soldiers only because of the situation, but uh, it was not our choice. I was teaching in a school here also, in secondary school. You were? Yeah, I was a teacher. 
but I studied in an American university in, in Rwanda. In Rwanda. Before 1990. Just kind of getting to know each other, just barely from across the table, and it was cool. It was very nice, but then they all started speaking in French, and the whole conversation, the whole meal was in French. And no guns were allowed around the table, which gave us a chance to relax. So here we were, breaking bread with this notorious African rebel, and all I could think about was my childhood having Sunday lunch after church with my grandparents and family, and how similar both these experiences were. The next place turns out to be a military sort of headquarters or an office or something. And I don't really understand what we're doing at this place, but then it becomes apparent this is where we're going to give the interview. This is my pinnacle moment as a filmmaker, my first film, and I am still so new with these cameras. Under the duress of the situation, I was fumbling, dropping things. I was just a wreck. But Doug came in. He's like, dude, calm down here. And Doug came along and pretty much set up the whole scene, got Kunda comfortable, got us all dialed in. And I think all I really did during the interview was distract everybody. But they pressed on. The Kunda and, and Doug, they seemed to connect during the interview. So I wasn't really able to listen to his words as much because I was so worried about the environment, the soldiers, the guns. The Congolese army wouldn't let us in here. And we had to sneak in here. The reason why we went through what we went through to get here, which was considerable, is because we don't believe that the truth has gotten out. We are fighting for our survival. Since 1994, the genocide in Rwanda, all those armed Hutu rebels who committed the genocide in Rwanda came in court. We saw that those rebels from Rwanda are now, since four or five, six years, allied to the government of Kinshasa. They are armed, rearmed, resupplied by the government, our government. So since 1994, they are in Eastern Congo, killing, raping, robbing, and you see? Then our people is living in displaced camp and in refugee camp. A foreigner coming in your country, you receive him like a refugee, then he, do, he take arms against you and against your people. It's not acceptable. does the Congolese government gain by arming them and, and letting them do what they want up here in the north? What they are paying them. Because in 1998, when the government of Kinshasa was attacked by Rwanda and Uganda, they recruited them to help the government to stop the, 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 the Rwandan and Ugandan army. And they, they did. All the diplomacy is being done in Kinshasa. They don't know what is going on in the Eastern Congo. It's a Congolese land. Even if Kabila is elected like a president, but he cannot give our land to, 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 to foreigners. Now our families are living in refugee camp in Rwanda. Right. As I can tell you, Tutsi cannot be back when FDLR in Terama are here. Because for them, a Tutsi is their enemy. So my family in Rwanda, many families, internal families are in, in displaced camp. Are, are you married? Yeah, married and uh, six children. Can you yourself, can you go to Kinshasa now? Can you come out of this region? Can you go to Goma to go have a meal? I'm not allowed. Not allowed yeah, at all? not allowed. Because I'm a rebel. Would they arrest you right away? But since we signed the agreement of Goma, mm -hmm. now I'm protected by that agreement. We went to the table in Goma, we were asking for it, and at least at the end of the day, we signed the, what we called Acte d'Engagement of Goma, in, uh, it was in January 23. So you signed the peace accord, but you, you're you waiting for the government, so to speak, to, to take their responsibility and to put those people back in Rwanda and stop arming them. For us now, we are not fighting the government, but we are fighting a problem, a threat. First of all, they must stop. To, 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 to supply them. Second, there is a way to resolve that problem. If FDLR, those who armed the Hutu, are not ready to be back to Rwanda, they must still be in Congo, but with a status of refugees. 
and a refugee cannot be armed. Are you going to move to Kinshasa? Do you want to work inside the government yourself? K yes, Kinshasa is my country. You see, Congo is my country. The whole Congo is my country. For me to go, I'll be sure that my people can live now freely, can move freely, and they are safe. What do you think about the United States, the UK, everybody coming in here to the Congo and taking your minerals? How would you regulate that to make it more beneficial for the Congolese people? There's no doubt that we're coming in here and we're taking without giving much. Yeah, but let us say they are taking with the commitment of the government. That to say it's not their fault. They are not robbing. They are not looting. They take after a commitment. So we have to arrange for our commitments. We have to know what we are going to get from that. So for me, the problem is not American or UK or Europe. The problem is Congolese. If we gave the Congolese government today $10 billion, would it reach the people? Would it, would it be out in these? Would, would any of the people on the ground see any of the money? They are giving. But where is that money? It's a matter of management. It's a matter of inner values. Congo is a troubled country. Congo is a destroyed country. Congo is an inexistent country. It asks for builders. It's a matter of leaders. Strong leaders. If you had absolute power right now in the Congo, you're the president. How would you make it all work? How would you, you know, what would be the main purpose? Uh, now I have means. I'm doing this without any means, based only on teaching, educating. But if I can have means to support this kind of life, this kind of, um, of sacrifice, if I can have now a support, I can do better. Yeah. I think I exercised for four years in this area, and it became a very peaceful area. Then I'm saying, oh, if I can have so much means, and a big area, then I can, I can. To change Congo, it's possible. <coughs> to change the army of Congo, it's possible. To have a strong army. Will you run for president one day of the Congo? So you want to do that? Let's say there is no Congo country. My, my first orientation is to have a country. Mm -hmm. Because when the country is occupied from all sides, Angolans took a part, Zambian took a part, Ugandan rebels are in Congo, Burundian rebels, Rwandan rebels, and the country is like there is no state. So I'm thinking about having a state. If we can have a state and a respected state in the hand of everyone, I can serve. I want to be a servant leader. I want to serve. Because yeah. you're very passionate. And you see, all the possibility we have can bring us wherever we want to go. In 10 years, in 20 years, we can but in the hands of a strategic person, a, a leader. The problem is that we don't have a leader. Since 1960, when we came from colonialism, there is no leadership in Congo. It was somehow a country who was forgotten, but through Tim Shortley and the State Department and your president, let us say thank you to America, thank you to, to, to American people. Because now, I think we are moving for peace and for long. And it will be on the honor of your people. Oh, that's great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And we think one day we will come in your country to say thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we'd love to have you here. We'd love to. <laughs> that's fantastic. Tony, go ahead and give him a uh, gift, too. We, uh, we brought a couple gifts for you. That would be all right. We knew we had to travel, so they're wrapped. It is a gift for you. Hey. Yes. Please open if you. Would you like me to open? The protocol of giving somebody like that a wrapped gift was something I was not prepared for. They all 
were very suspicious if there was something explosive or toxic in it. And so they whisked the gift right away. And I was like, no, no, I'm trying to get it back to give it to him. And he wasn't willing to take it. And I created kind of an awkward moment until I realized what was going on and we just kind of dropped it. It's just always such a volatile situation because of the cultural divide. You know, in America, you know, you know what's about to come. In, in Africa and a lot of foreign countries, it's just that quick turn of misunderstanding between two people. And the lives that they lead are, you know, it's God and the gun. You know, it's either or. There's not really too much gray area there. General made around 10 stops that day. Tony and I kept laughing as we followed the general from place to place, running after him like paparazzi. It made us feel like the parasites that stalk celebrities without mercy. Our next stop was an IDP camp. As the general walked around interacting with the people, I started to imagine, what would it be like to live here with my family? And to what extreme would I go to, to change this type of reality? The IDPs in the camp seemed genuine in their affection and respect for the general. But I do realize that with our cameras and 20 armed guards following him everywhere, they weren't exactly going to be filing complaints either. Laurent wants his, um, he wants the story out of what he's doing. He's very transparent, I'll give him that. You know, what we got from him, you know, there was political answers and, and whatnot, but um, he's pretty transparent, man. He's not really hiding anything. and. He's fighting for a reason, and he also wants to be legit, so why would he run around, you know, if, if, if everything that they claim, the rapes and the, you know, all that other stuff, why would you do that? Be a pastor, trying to go legit, trying to be part of the legitimate Congolese government and be doing all that. That's what didn't make sense. And so, you know, you just never know, but, you know, there was a big transparency to him, which I... I have to give him credit for. They were rebels for a reason, and they themselves were rebelling against that very system that was trying to hold us back. They understood it was not a good system. It oppressed people, and so that's why they were taking arms up against you know, their oppressors. They were delighted that we took the time to travel all the way from the U.S. and at least try to tell their story. We were escorted back into town, it was late at night, and we were taken into this compound, and uh, it was a strange compound, it really was weird. It, but we each were given our own room, and the only thing in the room was a bed. That was it. And I was given one gas lantern, blankets, no pillow, and decided to use the bathroom. Doug and I met for a real quick second, he said, oh my gosh, man. I said, oh, it's cool, we get our own room, we each get our own bed. He's like, dude, these are cells. This is a prison. And I started looking around and I realized, wow, he's right. <laughs> We're actually sleeping in prison cells. If they do get arrested, can they shoot us there at the border? No, they can't shoot us. Maybe they will take us. They will take us to jail and it will take time to get out of jail. You know? well, they, can they beat us up and... It can happen. Okay. Because, you know, the, the National Army are not in respect of anybody. That's what I know. Or what about confiscating our materials and our stuff from the National Army take our... Things? That can happen too. That's why I'm so scared that we should not get uh, arrested. That's, that can happen. If there's any information, any suspect about us in Goma, that's what I'm saying. We, we need to disappear from Goma, okay? We can't take the airport because we could get arrested at the airport. Yeah, right? exactly. Because there is every public services, government public services in the airport all the security services are there. So it's easy to, <laughs> to be caught at the airport. So if there's any suspect about us, we can just disappear from Goma. If we get to Rwanda and continue to Uganda, you take your plane from Entebbe. And actually it was that night where Doug told us all, stop worrying, stop it. We're not gonna sit here and get into this really negative space. Tomorrow's gonna be what it's gonna be, but we're gonna make it out of here. Everything was cool in the morning, we all jumped into the four-wheel drive. As we left, we anticipated that we would have to take the same long, treacherous road that got us here. We quickly learned that the general had arranged for us to leave this area by a much shorter route. It required a commander in our car and a truck in front of us with an armed escort. 
one of the commander's wives had to go into town um, with the baby. So that was kind of our cover. It was a three hour ride. And this baby just had laughed and had the best time and never cried, never complained, never moaned. Every, you know, 10 or so miles, an army of rebels would come out of the forest just out of nowhere and they'd stop and talk to us and say hello. And then they'd just disappear again, you know, in camouflage back into the jungle. Pastor had called the UN and said we need to help crossing the last checkpoint because we were probably going to be arrested. We had got to a certain point and our escorts uh, had to peel off and they came back to the car and said we can't go any further. And uh, by the way, the UN is not going to be there. At that point, it was thanks again, UN. Hopefully, you guys will make it across. Uh, now we got to get out of here. And, uh, <laughs> That's, That's going to be tricky. Out. We haven't quite worked that out. And the rebels had to turn around and go back because they were sort of in a no man's land where they weren't allowed to be in. It's dangerous for them. They could get arrested or killed or whatever. They were a target. There was a great pause inside of our vehicle. There was even a time of silence when we were just sitting on the road, the car was idling, and we were all internally processing this reality that we were about to face. The only thing we had, the only choice we had, we weren't allowed to go back into communities there. The only choice we had was to move forward. So we kind of all embraced that choice except for the driver. He was barely embracing that point. And we were encouraging him, just drive, dude, let's just, let's go, let's get it over with. Doug and I grabbed our packs, our camera packs, and we were ready to really dig our heels in to do our best to not make, to make sure nobody was gonna take our tapes away from us. They could even keep our cameras if it came down to us, but not the tapes. There was two reasons. The tapes could incriminate us for being inside Kuna's area, and without those tapes, no more film. This was another time when Pastor was like, we are going to jail, my friends. I don't know what we will do. We couldn't film, and everybody was on edge. Just came right up on IRC uh, Jeeps. They went flying by us on the road, so we stayed as close to them as we could, inches from their bumper, and we just flew at the same pace as them right underneath the bar, and we just kept on flying through town. It was the most amazing thing. The security guard was absolutely stunned. He couldn't even drop the gate on us. At that moment, we knew that they weren't going to be far behind us. We were in trouble. There was that elation, but then there was, okay, how long do we got? Stopped by the Indian Army camp, grabbed the rest of our cash. I, I felt like we were kind of being rude because they're so gracious hosts. And we just did not, I mean, we had to leave in like a minute. I strongly recommend the Indian Army if you're ever in trouble. Cool, understanding, bada boom, bada bang. Noble people, right? Noble. We start taking off for the main highway and we see the National Army just going pew, 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 right by this convoy. And we know what they're looking for. Us. They're pissed, somebody ran their gate. It's a big deal for them, it doesn't ever happen. We stormed their gate and got through. So they're ahead of us looking for us and we're behind them. The fear just took a new direction because we realized now we have to get out of the country. We we're going to our hotel to pack it up as fast as we can. Literally when we got to the hotel, that was when our, when our plane was supposed to take off called MAF saying, just please wait, please. And they said, we will call the pilot and ask him and get back to you. Our driver didn't speak one word of English. Hey, that's no. pay no. for you. Do it, do it, do it, no, 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 no. Listen, listen, to, listen to us, listen ah. to us. This is for going through the border. Bonus, mm. bonus. Yes. Okay, now take this money and go pay them at the uh, Desk. At the desk. We're to save time, I gave the driver the money to pay our hotel bill. He thought it was the pay we owed him for driving, which was way short of our agreements. He did not understand. The Congolese army could show up at any moment and arrest us, and I'm trying to give English lessons. And doing payroll at the same time. There was just always this barrier. No, 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 he's not understanding. This is for the hotel. So I gave the front desk cash for our hotel bill and told them to make a receipt while we went upstairs to pack. Our plane was literally waiting for us on the runway to take off. If we missed this flight, we would be stuck in Goma for three to five more days. That's how it works in remote areas of the Congo.
bada boom, bada bing. So now the receipt process. I had been hassled before leaving African countries for not having receipts for hotel stays to prove I had paid the bill. The last thing we needed at the airport was to be delayed over a simple receipt. But unfortunately in Africa, a simple receipt is a fully filled out form with a proper stamp, a signature, and 20 minutes of your life. We could literally feel the Congolese army putting the pieces together and closing in on us. We're about to get the receipt. Any second now. Yes! They gave us the notice. You have to be in that plane in 20 minutes because it's leaving. We had no idea what authorities would be waiting for us at airport security. So Pastor picked up his phone and made one last call. And as we were pulling up to the airport, they said they escorted us right through customs, right to that plane, and we were in the air in six minutes. Where the fighting is, to me, is when you're most alive, when you feel the absolute depth of who you are as a person. Having the first adventure, the first journey, be successful has given us, at least me, the confidence to keep trying when it's more difficult than seems reasonable. I thought I could shed some light on a problem, making an actual difference, changing the circumstance over there myself personally. No, not directly, but a ripple effect. I believe that with exposing problems, with it putting pressure on people through this medium that, yeah, it's gonna open up. And even since we've traveled there, more media has been allowed in there, the story's getting better coverage. Everybody's actions together will make a difference. Mine alone will not. <laughs>